Let's pray. Father God, we just ask your blessing on the word this morning. Be with us, bless us, open our ears that we may hear, Lord God, what the Spirit is speaking, Lord. Whether it's from the barn floor or the wine press, we pray this morning that we would receive something from you in our lives, that would be life changed, that we would not be the same person that arrived this morning, but you would change us from glory to glory for your name's sake. We commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, David, for that reading. There was a short one and a long one, so for David it was like a part three and a part five. But uh, thanks for that. Um, so this morning's message is simply called Walk, Stand, Sit. Walk, Stand, Sit. And I'm hoping that by the end of the sermon you would have understood what I'm trying to convey across with regards to those three verbs, those three postures. So, when we read in the first passage there in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it mentions from verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That particular scripture is called the Shema. It's the most important scripture in the Torah. And built upon that is where it tells us, Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And this word that you receive, it says, teach it diligently to your children when you are seated, when you walk in the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. So that essentially is the backdrop to this walk, stand, sit. It's foundational upon the Shema, the most important verse to the Jews of the Torah. So for Israel, it is walk, stand, sit. But I'll show you later when we draw to the conclusion how for us, the body of Christ, is slightly different. So nevertheless, when we look at Luke chapter 24 with Cleopas and his friend on the way to Emmaus, you'll notice that they first walk in. And I've told you before, it says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And Cleopas and his friend are talking and walking about the things of Jesus. And there in the midst is Jesus. But their eyes are holding just like ours. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12. Now we look through a glass darkly, but then we'll see face to face. Now we know in part, but then we'll know fully. So they don't understand all the things that the prophets had spoken, which Jesus reminds them. And their eyes are holding, their eyes are blinded in the walking. And then you'll notice that it draws to a period where they stand in and Jesus pretends that he's going to go on. But it's getting late. And they essentially say to him, abide with us. And the last hymn that Brenda's actually chosen for us to sing at the end is the hymn by Henry Light, which is called Abide With Me. And just to give you some backdrop to that particular hymn, this is the passage of scripture that inspired Henry Light to write that hymn. The words in one of the stanzas go something like this, Abide with me, fast falls the evening tide. It was getting late, fast falls the evening tide, it's getting dark. When dark and darkness deepens, O Lord, with me abide. It goes on and it says, When helpers fail and comforts Flee, help of the helpers, oh abide with me. I think our modern term would say, when days are dark, friends are few. So he gets this inspiration from this particular passage of scripture. It's interesting to know for the football players around you, in other words for Nigel, that in 1927, it was the first time in an English Cup final that a non-English team was in the final. It was Cardiff City. They came across from Wales. And they came to the FA Cup and they played Arsenal, your Reverend Jeff's football team. And on that occasion, they came and it was called the Singing Cup final. They came and they sang hymns before kickoff. And one of the, the hymns they sang was Abide With Me. And that hymn has become traditional that 15 minutes before kickoff since 1927, to present, that hymn is sang at every FA Cup final. Abide with me, fast falls the evening time. The Welsh brought 
their song to the FA Cup final. They sang him was King George V's favourite and it was also sang at Queen Elizabeth II's wedding. So nevertheless, that's where the story comes from. But you see this picture of walk, stand, sit. Their eyes are holding him, they're walking, they're trying to get Jesus to stand with him. And then it goes on to sit. When Jesus comes with them, they sit and it's in the breaking of bread that their eyes are open and then they see Jesus, whom he is. So it's important for us in this day to fellowship all the more when you see the day approaching and to have the breaking of bread and it's in those things that our eyes are open that we can see what we need to see, what the Lord is showing us. Walk, stand, sit. It's also mentioned the first psalm, Psalm 1. The psalmist writes there and he says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. The walk, stand, sit, Psalm 1. It comes out there. It'll be of note that Psalm 1, it's blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. The man is focusing on him being blessed on the earth. Psalm 150 is praise he the Lord. The psalmist has elevated his spiritual maturity and he's not focusing on himself me myself and i but he's focusing on jesus christ he's focusing on god in heaven praise he the lord praise him with all the musical instruments everything that has breath praise the lord and we heard about david who's suffering this morning from what glennis told us but he's still praising the lord everything that has breath praise the lord so we see in psalm 1 it focuses on the man, but then you get this elevation, the spiritual maturity on the Lord. I remember when I read the book, The Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger, he mentioned in the quotes, he says, The mark of an immature man is to die nobly for a cause, whilst the mark of a mature man is to live humbly for one. And we need to not focus on ourselves, but live humbly for God and focus on Him and bring glory to His name. It's worth mentioning that if you look at Paul's 13 epistles from Romans to Philemon, now that's not how they date, but that's how they put in the book, was they put in the Bible dispensationally. And I'll give you something on that in a moment. But the books of Paul, the 13 books, it first starts off with Romans. Now we know Romans isn't the first book he wrote because it's only recorded in Acts 27 that he was going to Romans. He had already, we know, been to Ephesus and Corinth and other places before him. But nevertheless, if you had to put the books of Paul in chronological order, you would have had 1 Thessalonians first, and you would have 2 Timothy last. But nevertheless, if you look at Romans, when Paul introduces himself in Romans, Romans 1 verse 1, he calls himself an apostle of God. But when you get to the 13th one, the book of Philemon, he simply calls himself a prisoner of God. With the mark of a mature man is to realize it's not me it's not my apostleship it's not my calling it's the things of god that matter so he was content to be called a prisoner of god and not have this title but just identify with them humbly from that of a, of a prisoner nevertheless so in the tradition of the Jews, they would have this walk, stand, sit. So you see it with Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus, they go through the postures of walk, stand, sit. You know, the good Samaritan, he gave up his time to be with the man that was beaten up on the side of the road. But the priest and the Levite, they walked and they actually crossed over and they walked on the other side because they didn't want to walk, stand and sit with the person that needed them. The most you know there's a, a passage and maybe i can ask um, mark would you mind bringing up in king james bible can you bring up two kings chapter 4 verse 29 for me please i just want to show the congregation something there with regards to this tradition of walk stand sit so it's very much steeped in this ancient jewish culture and that's how they would they would do it they would walk a bit with you they would stand a bit with you and they would fellowship a bit with you so psalm 1 tells us you know blessed is the man that walks not with the ungodly who are you walking with don't walk with the ungodly 
The late Jim Rohn said to us that we the average sum of our five closest friends. Who are your five closest friends? They're going to influence you. <coughs> the things you do, the habits you form, could be from those friends that you are with. Birds of a feather flock together. Who are you spending your time? Who are you walking with? You are standing in the way of sinners. Who are you standing with? People say, I, I stand with this one, or I stand with that, or, I stand with this organization. I stand with world peace. Or what, are the, what are you standing with? Is it contrary to scriptures? Is it contrary to the word of God? And what are you sitting with? Who are you sitting with? Who are you spending time? Who are you fellowshipping with? Who are you sitting with? Are, are they influencing your life negatively or positively for the good? Are you, are you coming together around a table and speaking of the things of God? Because that's how Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, when you sit, be diligent to your kids, teach them the way in your sitting, in your walking. Do you say grace before you have your meal? Do you speak, speak about the things of God? Do you speak about the things of God around your children so that they can grow up in the ways of the Lord? As Proverbs 22 verse 6 tells us, train up a child in the ways of the Lord so when he is old, he will not depart. So when we get to the passage, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 verse 29, please. When we get to this passage of scripture, it's with Elisha. And Elisha gets to hear that one of the children has died. And he realizes there's an urgency and he instructs Gehazi, his servant, to take his staff and to put his staff upon the kid until I get there. Do this. Thanks, Mark. Then he said to Gehazi, Good up, alone, take up a staff in thy hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, Salute him not. If you meet anybody along the way, don't greet him. Because if you greet him, from Jewish tradition, you're going to have to walk with him, you're going to have to stand with him, and you're going to have to sit with him, and you're going to be delayed in what you have to do, and the young boy is going to die. So again, I ask you, who you're walking with? Who you're standing with? Who you're sitting with? Thank you, Mark. So now you understand why he says in that particular passage. Why would he say, salute him not? If you meet any man longer, salute him. I mean, who understands that? Who, who's ever been told what that actually means? God bless you. Thank you very much. So now you know. You learned something. Amen. So, um, when we look at the New Testament now, in the book of Ephesians, in the same context of walk, stand and sit. What do we understand as the body of Christ in this age of grace with regards to us? How do we do it with Jesus Christ? So in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6, it tells us that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Now, it talks about our eternal position. Ephesians 2 6. It starts off, you'll notice, with sitting. We start off with sitting. Israel works towards seated. Walk, stand, sit. We start off seated. We start off with Christ Jesus. Seated with Him. It tells us in Romans 30, 12, it says that we are, in verse 11, it says that, Wake up from your slumber, for we near the day of salvation, then when we believed, the day of salvation we believed. Now, you were thinking, hang on a second, on the day of salvation, I believed, and is that not the same thing? But the day of salvation is that's when the Lord is coming, as we understand. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds, and there shall we meet the Lord in the air, so we are already seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Your eternal position as a Christian, once you receive the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior, you are saved. You can't lose your salvation. You are saved. You can lose rewards and you can lose crowns because that depends on how you walk. But your position, your eternal position is you seated with Christ. Then it goes on and says, in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 1 it says walk worthy of your vocation 
which is your calling. You might say, what does the word vocation mean? Vocation means calling. Work worthy of your calling. What have you been called to do? Paul said, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, he says, And I thank Christ Jesus my Lord, who has enabled me, having counted me faithful, and put me into the ministry. Counted is, it's, it's the word that, you, that an accountant would use to balance the scales, the debit and the credit. And he found in Paul a man that was worthy to be put out into the ministry that God had called him to do. So much so that in Romans 16 verse 25, Paul says, and he calls and he says, My gospel that the Lord gave to me from heaven. So how are you walking? Are you walking worthy of your calling? What is your calling? Are you called to be a Christian? Are you walking like a Christian? Do you have to tell people you're a Christian? Because if they would guess, they would, they would, never, they would never know. How are you walking? Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly. Counsel. Proverbs 11, 14 says to us that wisdom comes in the multitude of counselors. Where there are counselors, there is safety. Who is feeding you? Who are your counselors? Who are your tight five around you? Who do you speak to? Who do you phone? Who do you receive information from? Knowledge from? Wisdom from? Understanding from? What are you going to do? Who, are you going to, who do you go to? Are these people saved? Are these people drawing strength from the Lord? Who are your gurus? Who are your fortune tellers that you go into? That's feeding you. That's telling you stuff to do. How are you walking? So it's important that we walk. The Bible reminds us we need to walk in the light. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We need to walk in the light. It goes on in Romans chapter 13 verse 12. It tells us that also that therefore put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. The armor of light. We are going to now with the armor. So how are you walking? Are you walking in the truth? Are you walking in the light? If you walk in the light, you're not going to stumble. You're not going to fall. You're going to be ready. You're going to be able to see. You can see the stepping stones before you. Thy light is a, a lamp unto my feet and a lamp and a light unto my path. You can see where you're going. When darkness deepens, O oh Lord, abide with me because the Lord is your spiritual torch that's shining the way for you on your celestial path as you walk. So how are you walking? Don't fall short of the glory of God and the things that He has in store for you. Your rewards. You know, how you walk He's going to determine your rewards and with regards to your crown. Paul mentioned there, he said that, Wherefore there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, who the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, but not me only, they also that love is appearing. There's a crown for you and there's a crown for me, but how are we walking? Are we going to walk to receive the crown? Are we going to walk to receive the rewards? Lest some of us enter into the kingdom by the skin of our teeth. We've got our eternal position. We go to heaven. But how are you getting there? What are you carrying with you? What are you taking with into the kingdom? How you walk in is important. Not just the destination. But what you're bringing to the Lord to lay at His feet. That He can look to you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I gave you five talents and you've come back with ten. What talents are you bringing to the Lord so that you can be rewarded in the heavens? You see, the, your eternal position is with regards to how you are sitting. But your eternal condition, your condition, your state, that's how you're walking. In Philippians chapter 4, 11, Paul said there, he said that, not that I... Um, uh, let me just get it not, not that I speak in respect of want but I have learned in whatever state I am in there were to be content are you content in the state that you are in because that's how you walk in is your contentment one Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 tells us essentially six words. It says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. God first and then contentment. Are you content? I know people that aren't content in their marriage. I know people that aren't content in their workplace. I know people that aren't content in their church. 
I know people that aren't content. How are you walking? What is your spiritual condition? If we look at you spiritually, your condition, how are you walking? Are you content in the Lord? And then it tells us about stand. Sit, walk, stand. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 11. It tells us to put on the spiritual armor. You know, when you sit, it's about your spiritual position. We're a child of God. We're sons and daughters of the Most High God. We're with Christ in heavenly places. When we walk in, it's got to do with our spiritual condition. What is your condition? How are you spiritually? Have you got spiritual leprosy? Or you're walking in spiritual victory? And the next one is stand. Your spiritual standing. It's your spiritual warfare. How are you fighting the good fight? In your spiritual warfare. Do you have a belt of truth? Do everything you do, does it concern truth? Or you, do you dabble in falsehood and lies and hypocrisy? Do we walk in truth? Wendy prayed earlier in the prayer intercession about having leaders that are men of integrity, men of honesty, not dabbling in, in lies and feeding us false information, false negatives. Give us leaders that can stand up for the truth of God. Not to be sold out for money. For bribery blinds the eyes. So how are you standing? We ought to be standing with the, the shield of faith. Stand up in faith. This guy David hasn't got much, but I think he's got faith. The breastplate of righteousness. Christ is our righteousness. That's how, we, that's how we're standing. We're standing with His righteousness. The helmet of salvation, you, you've got your helmet of salvation. Your gospel shoes of peace and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of the Lord, Hebrews 4.12 tells us. For the word of the Lord is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even unto the dividing and sunder of soul and spirit and joints of marrow. And he's a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. That's what you have in your hand. Let the high praise of God be in my mouth and a two-edged sword in my hand. Psalm 149 verse 6. That's what you're armed with. You're armed in spiritual warfare. But how are you standing when the devil comes? Because the Bible tells us to stand against the wiles of the devil. And he's going to try and come with his devices. The devil's device is going to try and come at you. But have you got your shield up? Are you clothed in your breastplate? Have you got your belt of truth? Your helmet of salvation? Your gospel shoes of peace? Your sword of the spirit, and you're going forth in prayer. So with Israel, it was walk, stand, sit. That was the tradition that led them to this place of city. With us, through Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, 4, verse 1, 6, 11, it tells us that we already see it. We got to walk, and then we got to stand with our armor on. So I pray that I've been able to convey across to you this message that for us, the title, if you remember one thing, other than, other than why he didn't greet anybody, <laughs> somebody doesn't greet you next time, don't be offended, he might have a mission that he's trying to get to. But if you remember anything, maybe the title of the message should have been this. Sit, walk, stand. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, John.